Welcome to Classical Etc., a show that dives into the philosophy, culture, and heart of classical education. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. All right, we're back for another episode of Classical Etc., and I'm sitting with Paul Schaefer, Dr. Dan Scheffler, and Mitchell Holly. And today we're going to be talking about why ancient languages and learning them yourself is awesome. Speaking why, of why languages, why, why you are already <laughs> laughing? I, it, it well, too many reasons. But Paul, what, uh, I would like to uh, take this moment while we're talking about language to point out that my last name is Schaefer, and Dan's last name is Scheffler, and we are not brothers. No, yeah. <laughs> I was, he has a C and I have no C in my name. I and I have no L that. and he has an L. No, uh, some people have been. Gotcha. So I feel like this is, this is a moment. This is a good moment. So that's where we're headed. And, and basically I've brought <laughs> three of the nerdiest guys I know who have spent an incredible amount of time studying ancient languages. We don't love using the word dead around here because there's a lot about Latin that is living in our culture and in the, the language we use every day. But it is a language that don't, it's not native to anyone. And there's a lot of collective years of people studying this language at this table. And then also Greek. And for the record, Greek is still spoken today. And then if you want to throw in Hebrew, the language I've studied the most of these, you know, Jerusalem, Greece, Athens, Roman. (laughs) I think this is a good moment to um, say the poem that I learned as a student under Mrs. Lowe when I was in third grade, fourth grade. Latin is dead, as dead as can be. It killed the Romans. Now it's killing me. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, you know, I don't feel like she really, really had any issue with us saying that as we, you know, chanting it as we came into class. So that's where we're headed in a few minutes. Before we get there, I want to ask you guys to bring me up to speed. Yesterday, you, there was a Fellowship of the Ring book discussion, and all three of you participated. Mm. Give me a little bit of snapshot of what that discussion was like. And, and we what spent you most about. of our time talking about um, Bombadil, Tom Bombadil, because it wasn't, it, we didn't spend there was some this, controversy. Yeah, there was over, some controversy. Over Tom Bombadil. Uh, you know, there were those who believe that he's merely a plot device to move the, the, the thing along uh, the narrative along. And then, you know, obviously uh, Dan had a more uh, encompassing, all encompassing sort of take. Well, I don't think, I don't think Tom Bombadil can be merely a plot device because he think about just the sheer number of pages that that whole episode occupies and the attention to the detail and, and whatnot. Uh, Butterbur in Brie is a plot device. You need, you need an innkeeper in Brie. You got an innkeeper in Brie. There's not much more to that. He's got a little bit of characterization, but Tom Bombadil is a little more than that. Right. Mitch, were you in the plot device camp or is that just other other people? So I've read, read this many times and I've always been perplexed and slightly angered by Tom. Um, uh, and, uh, and how he might fit into the narrative. I feel like I made some steps though. You're just Uh, jealous of his boots. Yeah. His boots. Yeah. His Hmm. boots are yellow. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> They're nice boots and boots are important in the woods. Um, I would like to clarify that I neither was in the plot device camp, but I, I have been repeating to Mitchell over the period of about 48 hours. You <laughs> need to just let Tom be Tom. Mm. And that's, I think an important thing that Tom teaches us. I like well, it. I mean, I guess I would say <laughs> that I've always been perplexed by this character that, that, Clearly there's something we're supposed to learn from him. He takes up a lot. He's not just a plot device. He doesn't appear because he's not just uh, moving things along. Right. He, there's this uh, ademic sex sort of second Adam, right. He's naming creatures. He's, he's in a garden. He's, you know, cultivating the land he's living there, you know, so what is this uh, um, ademic feature or character doing in a story like this? I think I made some headway in the discussion. It was good. It was, it, it, we, but we did spend most of the time a good like 40, 30, 30, 45 minutes talking about Tom. But we would, we, I think Mitchell and I agree that we would really, what we would like is to be with Tom, to walk through the woods with Tom. Yeah. Go swimming with Tom, you know, just cause he swims, you know, just be with Tom and not have to, because Tom doesn't let you understand his purpose and you will understand that by being with Tom. Yeah. That's why I enjoy those moments. But then I also like right at the end, it, it occurred to me that if, if Bombadil were purely a plot device or a way to further the plot, then 
the things that Tom saves them from could be f- cut out if they weren't essential. Mm-hmm. And so like mm-hmm. the Barrow Whites and this Willow tree that swallows up Mary and Pippin, like what's essential about those things um, that then Bombadil would have to be created to save them from. Mm-hmm. And I think that's worth asking as well of like, why do we need to know that the Barrow Whites, what's, what's that whole episode about? Um, I feel like that often gets forgotten. Mm hmm. Um, in conversations of the fellowship. Yeah. Now, did anyone, while you were discussing, bring up Tolkien's kind of own fascination with languages? I mean, it seems like that is a big part of who he was and what connects to our conversation today is this is a guy who is an expert in many, many ancient languages. Mm -hmm. Many people think, of course, of the Anglo-Saxon languages that he mastered, but also he wrote the Jonah translation in the Jerusalem Bible. So he knew Hebrew. Um, He, you know, every classicist knew Greek and Latin at that point. Um, did any, anybody touch on his, the vibrancy of the languages in Fellowship of the Ring during your discussion? I think Dan talked about that the most because I think he has the most experience with the languages. Right. Yeah, Dan's fluent. And, uh, <laughs> Get someone off for a translation. <laughs> All the varieties of Elvish. Elvish. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be the uh, elven greeting. A star shines upon the hour of our meeting. A lot, very it, beautiful thing to say. It is beautiful. <laughs> open <laughs> conversation with that. Beautiful, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's Let's try that, 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 that you mentioned yesterday was, uh, you, you brought this fact that, um, language always comes to, comes to presence in a culture and a, and so, uh, middle earth was sort of built around, mm-hmm. was built out of the language that he first created. So in, in other words, you can't have a language without having an embodied language mm-hmm. um, because you have to reference things. You have to, you know, it has to describe actions, events, uh, typologies, right? Those things all have to come to presence in a physical situation. And so the world of Middle Earth sort of is the manifestation of this is the point mm-hmm. you made. So I'm making your point that you made yesterday so I can be cool. That was a great point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I think, I think that's. Well, and back to your point <laughs> about Adam and naming things, you know, I think a central theme in uh, Tolkien is man, our capacity as rational spiritual beings to be sub creators uh, and to to exercise that naming uh, mm-hmm. along with Adam that we can imaginatively create uh, poetry and we can create stories and we can create whole worlds. And that's part of what fascinated Tolkien about uh, myth and and fantasy. And you can create this entire mm-hmm. uh, world and he's creating that language uh, many, many languages actually for, for middle earth and this whole, uh, vast cosmos to, uh, be a place for that, for that language. Uh, and I think that that shows that incredible, uh, joyful, beautiful capacity that our minds have, uh, for imagination and, and literature. And so this conversation that we're going to have about language is not disconnected from, uh, all these larger conversations that we have about uh, man's place in the universe and the role of the imagination in education and literature and poetry and beauty and joy and all. That. I love that point because when I'm you know subbing and teaching Latin or encouraging students to take Latin, I don't usually make this argument, the one that you just made, but I think one of the reasons I've loved studying ancient languages is because of the worlds it's given me contact with in a way that I wouldn't be able to live in those worlds in any other way. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that keeps me coming back to the books that are written in these other ancient languages. So let's transition in that direction. And Mitch, I actually want to kick it to you because I brought down Mitchell Holly's second form Greek, an introduction to Hellenistic literature, uh, Greek, I should say that took a long time to write. It took a very long time for me to write this, <laughs> but it's excellent. And you're a Greek student, but actually what I think would be helpful for our conversation is if you would actually just orient us to the languages for someone who doesn't know anything about Latin or Greek, or maybe even Hebrew, who used Latin, what books are written in Latin, who used Greek, what, what books are written in Greek, kind of start us there. And then from there, we can talk about our experiences with these languages. Yeah. I mean, obviously the oldest 
uh, one of the oldest languages uh, is Greek, obviously. And uh, I mean, it's one of the few languages that has survived as long as that it has. Um, maybe a good comparison would be um, some form of Mandarin, right? That goes back pretty far. But um, but surely Greece, Greek, the Greek language is, is, is so old that uh, those who read Homer, um, if, if you're a modern Greek speaker, you might still have trouble reading Homer because the language has grown and developed so much. Uh, but stepping back a little further, uh, what's really important about Greek and also Latin is that most th- those who uh, wrote and thought in uh, in Greek and in Latin have provided such a foundation for philosophy, for mathematics, for medicine, for um, uh, for literary analysis, for education, for um, for even how to do history. I mean, those languages and those who thought and spoke in those languages and those who certainly those who wrote in those languages provide such a, um, you know, just think about philosophy. It's impossible to do philosophy today without having some contact with Greek authors. They've sort of parsed out the entire landscape of what questions are important, why you should ask certain questions. Um, and then, you know, um, Uh, you know, obviously we're still arguing about Plato and Aristotle today, you know? So, um, the mere, you know, these, it, and it, what's also an important point to make here is not just that it's something about Greek and Latin, um, but it's the cultures that have, that were embodied by those languages. Um, we still feel and are shaped by those cultures and a language always comes to presence in a culture Um, and so those two things are the culture side of things and the language side of things are something we're affected by everywhere we look. Um, I don't know if that's quite, you asked the question, uh, you know, who spoke these languages and, uh, back to the earlier comment that just because something is not the native language of someone or of anyone doesn't necessarily mean that it's dead. Right. right? Uh, because, a, a lot of the very important people who spoke and wrote uh, things in Latin uh, and in Greek uh, were medieval <laughs> authors that didn't uh, have these as native languages. Uh, but for thousands of years, Latin has been, especially in the in the West, Greek more in the East, uh, formed a foundation of uh, learning and scholarship and communication amongst educated individuals. And so if, if you want that uh, contact with the whole of uh, Western civilization, uh, that's who spoke Latin and Greek. Uh, and I mean, I think when we're talking about the ideas that the, the Romans and the Greeks that originally spoke these as native languages kind of brought forth, gave us this foundation. I think it's important to point out that words have connotations and they have usages within that particular language. And so when we talk about um, a, a given concept, even though we can translate that into or out of an ancient language, doesn't mean that's a one for one relationship, right? So you can say, um, you know, I don't know, uh, philosophy, right? Philosophia in English. But Greek's got some connotations mm-hmm. going on there mm-hmm. that English doesn't have. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, the, you know, that's where actually when you get into to very high level discussions, I don't know, mid-level discussions, <clears throat> where sometimes you want to throw in the, the, langu- the word from the other language because you're trying to bring with it all of that, that those 3,000 years of baggage that that word has that don't exist in the English language. It's one of the reasons why you run into a pretentious scholar and they're always saying German words Mm -hmm. and you're like, stop, (laughs) stop doing that. But the reason they're doing it is because the word Sitzin Leben has now a particular technical connotation. Mm -hmm. You just can't get any other way. Right. In the beginning was the logos. You know, you can translate that as word. Most people do, but that does not communicate the fullness of, of that that word. Now I'm the first to criticize. There's that kind of typical pastor move. Who's had like one year of Greek and in seminary, you know, and they're like, and the Greek word for this, for this word that's being translated as slave is doulos. And guess what doulos means? You see, it's a different word. It means 
slave. <laughs> right? <You know? laughs> and, and we've all, I'm sure we've all heard that kind oh, of goodness. thing in a sermon, but they, the truth is that there really are some pretty critical keywords that you, you are missing uh, if you're getting it in translation. And of course they're prone to those sorts of individuals are highly prone to committing etymological fallacies, uh, uh, right. you know, as they sort of uh, magnify one right. word to the point of, stupidity uh, my, my favorite is uh, sin hamartia means, to means miss missing the mark right it's an archery term i'm, I'm <laughs> sure we've all heard that it meant that i suppose back in like homeric greek but by Goodness. the time we get to the first century in the writing of the new testament it clearly means willful moral sin a right. willful violation definitely of, not used just uh, a oops to refer to <laughs> <an> archer <laughs> you know um, yeah it's it, it which also speaks to the situation of the word how it's being used over yeah. time and that's why greek and latin um is uh, an interesting language like you take the word logos for example mm -hmm. you know the word logos we often translate it as word in first john one uh, one one but it it doesn't it's it's use historically from Homer on to the new Testament. It's been used in so many other rich ways mm -hmm. to mean logic or reason or speech. Right. And so when the, the account the, given right, in, a, in a court, yeah. Yeah. right, right. Um, and so there's, there's so much more texture to the word logos that really it, it, it requires not only a knowledge of Greek, but a knowledge of the history of Greek. Mm -hmm. um, and to go back to the history question, um, why would, why is it the case that, that Greek is a classical language at all? Um, it might be helpful to think about. Um, well, it really goes back to Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great took uh, the Greek language of Athens and around 333 BC, when his empire was at its highest, he brought the Greek language to the entire world. And so that it's hard to overestimate how, um, how cataclysmic uh, Alexander was for the spread of Greek culture. Um, you know, you think of uh, the Jews in the first and second century um, in Palestine um, or in Judea or wherever or the Jews living in Egypt, they all spoke Greek. Um, and so they were heavily influenced by Greek culture uh, because of the inter introduction of the Greek language. And this is why in the, as you're explaining in the uh, East, Greek was the, even in the Roman empire during the Roman empire, uh, Greek was the primary language spoken and written all the legal documents um, in the Roman East. Um, can we pause here for a moment and just while we're, you know, um, puffing ourselves up and our ability to know the proper etymolo et etymologies of certain words and the, and the history of these words, right. That, our goal to learn these languages is not so that we can sit in the pew and go, that guy doesn't know what he's talking <laughs> about. <true>. Right. <laughs> um, it's an added benefit. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there is just a personal richness and mm, knowing mm -hmm. this and mm -hmm. having at your disposal an ability to go and read those texts in the original languages. I mean, I haven't read a text in Greek in years but I know I could, and I know I could, I could find out exactly what that text meant, but it's also just doing all of this in my formative years. Yeah, so let me pause you because this is exactly where I want to go. And I want you, I well, want to double click Let me go there, Shane. Well, well, let me get you there. <laughs> let me lead you. <laughs> I think this conversation can be a little bit distancing for people because mm -hmm. we have spent a lot of years trying to get there. And so I want to ask you about each of your kind of journey learning these languages and the process and moment and reflect on moments where you're like, this is a joy because a lot of people may, I would encourage them to start doing this later in life. And they, if they do that, they may not be able to reach a certain mm -hmm. you know, height in the language, but it really, it was that mm -hmm. process that I think is the most mm -hmm. valuable part. So talk, talk about that. Well, I mean, when you start young, so I, I've told people I didn't realize until like eighth grade that not everybody studies Latin when they're kids. I mean, it was just, it was the bubble I was in. Every kid is in some sort of a bubble. And you know, in my bubble, kids started Latin in third grade and they just kept on going. And it wasn't until I switched schools in eighth grade and realized, you know, this priest over here is asking these kids, if they've studied any, any Latin at all, I'm like, what a dumb question. <laughs> um, and that's when it kind of dawned on me. Oh, wait, this isn't 
normal. Um, and so, you know, that I, I I don't have a before, if you will, Mm -hmm. of, before I, I, I felt this and then all of a sudden, like it, I, I decided to take that and that, that, um, you know, uh, task upon myself and enjoy it. But what really, um, was sort of, it's, it's interesting when I think about my high school, cause I was, so Spanish was added in seventh grade, Greek was added in ninth grade. So I was doing Greek, Latin, and Spanish all through high school and in high school, you know, our, our experience was, you know, that, that priest coming in with Virgil's and he had set it down on the desk and we had done basically no translation before that, other than what's in the workbooks. And he said, you translate 10 lines every 45 minutes, you get an A, otherwise you fail. And, you know, and I remember translating at least 10 words every 45 minutes and really having no idea what was going on in the text, you know, and he tried, he tried to help us understand what was going on in the text. But even though I was able to sort of systematically do it, I didn't understand reading text until I was actually at a college level Mm -hmm. reading Augustine. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is, this is so different Mm -hmm. from, you know, what I was used to in the, um, you know, in the learning phase of the language. And I had gotten to a facility that all of a sudden those, those doors were open to me. Mm -hmm. And that's where all of a sudden Latin words, I'm like, Oh, that, that has all of this other richness to it that in high school translating mm-hmm. Virgil, I, I had no idea. Well, at some level that's not even just the Latin learning. It's the maturity of all the other parts of your mind as sure, well. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But that's, I mean, it was really that college level when I was doing, so we were doing Chrysostom in Greek and we were doing um, Augustine and Latin. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's when I was really like, wow, this is, this is actually something that I now enjoy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Cheryl had a, a, after she passed away, I was reading this Latin binder she'd put together and she was talking about the senior level of Latin. And one of the phrases she used was a begrudging affection. Mm -hmm. And I've just, I, ever since I've just held on to that because that's very much, uh, that was my experience. Not, not that I, it's not like I ever dreaded going to Latin class. I dreaded going to Greek class, but, um, but I walked out definitely with an affection and at sometimes it was begrudging, um, you know, but that I've, was 10 I've years I've got work. kind of the opposite okay. story yeah. from Paul. This might be a good contrast. So, uh, I've got very severe, uh, ADD. And so that, uh, shaped a lot of my early learning. And so I didn't, I didn't learn to read for instance, uh, until I was in fourth grade. Um, not because the resources weren't there, uh, but because I just wasn't interested and it was, it was boring. Uh, my dad was reading me CS Lewis books at home, you know? And, uh, so C spot run was, was boring and I just couldn't (laughs) discipline myself to, uh, to do it. So my, my English reading started till after Paul's already doing Latin, you know? Um, and then I, uh, I did terribly in French in, uh, I think it was in seventh grade. And, uh, so this, um, I got it kind of fixed in my head that I was just bad at languages. Mm -hmm. And so I was, we were looking for ways to get out of doing spoken language. I did a sign language in, Mm -hmm. in high school, uh, and then looking for college programs that didn't have a foreign language requirement and all the rest, because I was kind of convinced that I was bad at this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I come to college and there's a, a great classics program at the University of Kentucky. People come from all over the world just to go and do, they have a spoken Latin thing there. Terrence Tunberg and Milena Minkova are kind of well known in that uh, spoken Latin uh, world. And I stumbled in to that uh, that Latin and uh, a little bit later Greek world as a, as a sophomore. Um, I met uh, professor Hubert Martin at uh, the university of Kentucky who became a, a very kind mentor to me uh, and really helped me in the early phase of, of my scholarship. And so uh, I started doing Latin and Greek intensively in college. Um, and Dr. Martin uh, talked me into doing the combined uh BA and an MA in five years kind of package called the university scholars program there at uh, Kentucky. And so I 
was doing graduate level mass, uh, you know, Greek and Latin, um, sort of thrown into it. My senior year was my first year of, of graduate school. Mm. And so my whole junior year, uh, Dr. Martin sat me down and said, okay, well, we got to get you up to speed on graduate level reading work in both Greek and Latin. So I went from zero to, you know, reading this stuff in just a couple of years. And I share this story, uh, just as an encouragement to everybody out there who didn't start like, Paul in third grade, uh, that it's possible, Sure, you know, now it, it took some time, you know, I, uh, I am extremely grateful. I'm, I'm mentioning all these names specifically to give public shout outs to the people who really helped me along the way. Uh, but a- Amy Clark, uh, was a teacher there at, at university of Kentucky, uh, who now I think teaches in one of our Latin schools, uh, in Lexington. Um, but she, uh, she did this intensive Greek program. Mm. And so, uh, my, I think it was my sophomore year uh, or no, this was my junior year to get me up to speed for, for graduate school. Cause I started Greek after I started Latin, we were studying Greek for an hour class every day, Monday through Friday. Mm. And then I was doing two hours of prep work after that class. And that continued on into the summer. Everybody else dropped out of the intensive Greek, uh, except for me and this one other guy. And, uh, so the university wasn't going to pay her to continue it over the summer because there wasn't the enrollment for it, but she opened up her home. Wow. And, uh, so I made this deal. At, I didn't have any money as a junior yeah. in, in, in college. And so I hung drywall in her house and in some insulation and did yard work and cleaned out her basement and whatnot. And then we would, so I'd do like an hour of work or something. And then we would sit on her front porch and read Herodotus. That was my first wow. text in, in Greek. And we would just go line by line, uh, for an hour, two hours, sometimes Monday through Friday for the whole summer, you know? And so that's, this is me saying you don't have to start early, but, uh, you, you can catch up, but it, it does mean time and dedication yeah. to, you know, uh, I'll read Herodotus with you if you did some stuff around the house. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little past that. <laughs> <laughs> Any moments along the way where you were reading a particular book or passage where it just kind of hits you that this is the reward of all of that work that oh, you can recall? Oh yeah. I, so right after that Herodotus class that I just told you about class, um, I jumped right into the to graduate level work. And the first thing that I did was uh, read pl- some platonic dialogues with, uh, with Dr. Martin mm. Um, and he, first of all, he's just a great professor. He's a big Plutarch guy. So he's always mm. pulling examples out of Plutarch's lives of these famous, uh, Greeks and Romans and whatnot. Um, but they're reading that those platonic dialogues for the first time, uh, that's when I fell in love with Plato and that, that ended up becoming my, my mm-hmm. PhD. The other story is on the Latin side. I took a class with David Hunter at mm-hmm. the university of Kentucky, who's a great patristics scholar. And we took this Augustine class that was Tuesday, Thursday and Tuesday, the whole class period was just devoted to Latin, mm-hmm. just getting the language straight. We'd read it line by line, answer all the grammar questions, all that kind of stuff. And then Thursday was all theology. We were just discussing the ideas. And I remember that I had a similar moment to Paul. Augustine was was when Latin really clicked for me beyond just, OK, I'm part painfully parsing every single word and suddenly having those aha moments of I understand this sentence. Yeah. This is beautiful. And for those who don't know, Augustine was the court rhetorician for the emperor in Milan. I mean, top post of of as a rhetor in in the, in Rome. Uh, and so his I mean, his facility with language is just on another level. Uh, sure. except <laughs> it's his, so uh, beautiful, except his Greek wasn't that good. That's true. That's true. Because he was a Roman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mitch, what about your, your journey? Oh, I would say it's a combination of these two in the sense that I kind of begrudgingly turned into a, uh, a, a little bit of a Greek scholar, I suppose, in the sense that I started Greek in eighth grade, uh, continued through high school, uh, then 
and then when I was going into college, I was thinking to myself, what can I do that's easy? Um, and I had already done so much Greek at that point. I was like, I guess Greek is easy. So like, we'll keep doing that there. <laughs> and you know, we, you, you and I were in Greek classes together in college where those classes were essentially, uh, you know, I remember the upper level Greek classes where the professor was like, you need to come to class and you need to list the 15 uses of this participle in this text and this sentence. And you need to defend why your interpretation <laughs> of this participle is yes. not definitive Dr. Hudson. reading of, of, uh, of how this should be translated. Yeah. And you had to come with like evidence and you're going to weigh the linguistic evidence. You're going to say, uh, well, this is a circumstantial participle and it's probably communicating some sort of manner or means. Right. Um, and so I, I say begrudgingly was turned into this because I was forced into it when I was young um, and I didn't really love it. Um, and then I was looking for something easy and I had some facility with it. So I did it in college, but then it, at some point it, it turned for me uh, in college where, you know, I began thinking about the text that I was able to read and I was able to read. I was, I was, I was just so excited and overwhelmed honestly with what I was learning from these texts that ultimately I said, Hey, this has got to be a master's. And then that turned to two masters and now working on a doctorate, um, you know, in Greek and trying to work through the text. So I'm no longer dealing with the grammar, but funny story. I went through the grammar three times, <laughs> once in eighth grade, once again in college. And then when I was in spoken Greek, we went through the grammar again um, to do, I'm sure you're familiar, you probably had a similar sort of trajectory, but went through the grammar three times. It took three times through <laughs> the Greek grammar uh, before it really was, I, it sort of just cat. I mean, I began to see the world in a different way uh, because I began to think in uh, the, the language of Greek. And, um, and so, I mean, it, now it's just captivated everything that I love doing. One of my moments where it kind of the, the reward of all that work kind of clicked in was that Mitch and I were in a class that's kind of renowned at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary the last couple of years called Advanced Greek Grammar, where Dr. Peter Gentry leads his students through the Epistle to Diognetus, which is an early, early Christian literature. And it's just very difficult biblical Greek um, relative to other uh, books that are written in biblical Greek. And he, the, the professor makes all of his students sign a covenant that they will not use any technology while they're in the class to parse words and look up meanings. And you have to use a paper dictionary. So they go and get this paper dictionary and Mitch and I would meet every morning at a coffee shop at like six in the morning and yeah. we would sit and we would flip through our paper dictionaries reading it. And I remember the first few chapters being such a slog, so uh -huh. difficult. And then about chapter four, we started to figure out the diction of the author and started to kind of see how the different ways that he was using verbs and participles made sense. And the connections that, Oh, this is a lot like Peter. That's really interesting. And all the different things came alive. And I just, that was, that was a lot of fun. And, you know, we did it together. So we would argue about how things mm -hmm. were used and getting heated debates and very heated fight. debates, mainly because he would use, uh, this was an author who wrote very, very much in the classic Greek style. And so he would use, you know, 10, 15 infinitives in one sentence. <laughs> and, you know, and so you're just sitting there asking, why are you, how, how are you using these 15 infinitives in this, you know, sentence that's eight, eight lines long. Um, so it was a good, yeah. so we, we've all learned languages, but for those who haven't learned those languages yet, but would aspire to what's the best way to learn a, a classical language like Latin or Greek. You guys have mentioned, um, you know, immersive approaches, but we, we kind of advocate for a grammar translation approach. Can you guys talk about the difference between those and how that works and what you would recommend to people? Well, I mean, I think you've got to, you've got to, before you say which method is better or, you know, I, I was kind of assuming, I guess people know what methods there are. But, um, you have to ask what your goals are, mm -hmm. you know? And so if you want to be able to read a text well and read deeply and understand everything that's going on in that text, then you need to understand the grammar well. Um, and so that's where a, a grammar first approach is great, especially if you're starting younger. Um, there, there is a, there is this weird thing that once you get into high school and you want to, you're like, why am I just sitting here memorizing stuff? Um, and so having, you know, giving them practice 
quickly if they're if you're if you're going to start learning the language later then the grammar school is helpful but um but you know th- what i realized was because i started studying from a grammar first approach in third grade by the time i hit um spanish in seventh grade I mean, you talk about genders of nouns, old hat. You talk about making your, your your nouns and adjectives agree in gender, even if the ending doesn't match, old hat. You talk about, you know, conjugations, old hat, right? All of that stuff was mm-hmm. easy. Um, and I saw, you know, when I went and immersed myself in French speaking Canada, second year of college, you know, I saw um, other people that had come, you know, had, had, come at the same time that were significantly that were struggling much more learning French, not because they weren't as bright as me, but purely because they didn't know grammar. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is what that, that approach got me that Mm -hmm. or or gave me that I uh, otherwise would not have had. And you're speaking to that in the younger years, there's a sort of, obviously our goal with learning Latin and Greek is that you would get to the point where you are immersed in the language you'd be able to read original texts and you'd be able to interact with those ideas in in their fullness Uh, but in the younger years there really is a dual function where latin and greek are also serving to not just develop a sort of communicative competency but a grammatical competency as well and that's where in the early years latin and greek have been the time-tested tools to, to instill grammatical competency in students and i will say this that having started early uh, in those things myself when it came time for me to to develop communicative competencies whether it was spoken greek or turkish or german uh, those things came with at a, in a click and paul's experience is very similar when he was uh, you know in, in french speaking canada and then and when you went over to italy um, you know, you were, you're able to just qu- very quickly pick up those, um, uh, sp- uh, spoken competencies because you have such a good foundation in, in the grammar mm-hmm. and you know how language works. You know, mm-hmm. there's a cumulative mass sort of, uh, that, that goes on where, um, you know, those scholars who know uh, a lot of languages that are closely related, like, mm-hmm. um, well, it's easy. It's always easier to learn more languages once you have one or two. Right. And that's where it, it we don't want to underestimate the dual, the dual, uh, <laughs> the, the dual function of, of uh, uh, language study in those early years. I just want to clarify when you say it's easier to learn another language when you know one or two, you mean one or two additional than your native language. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's really hard for native speakers to analyze their own language. Absolutely. Because it's, yeah. especially English, because you, uh, and numerous linguistic studies have demonstrated this without, so everyone in the field of linguistics just knows that if you're a native speaker of your own language and you ask them, how do you know that you know? I don't know. <laughs> you know, how do you know that you're using adjectives correctly or that in English adjectives have to be in a certain order? Or how do you know that it's run, ran and walk, walked? And those are two different ways of forming the past tense. Did you have to sit down and teach your kid that? Sometimes you do, but most of the time kids just not, they assimilate, it. They, they assimilate that yeah. information. So how does a native speaker know that they know? Well, the answer for that student is they're they're born speaking it and acquired uh, languages do not work like native right. languages there's yeah. a common misconception uh that i see in people uh where they say look when you're when you're native and you're a baby you just listen to it you just absorb it and so i'm just gonna like play tapes of people speaking italian and then i'm just gonna you know right it's gonna work the same way but it doesn't because no. acqu- acquired languages uh, whatever your methodology, it's never going to be the same thing as your, as your first language. Right. Yeah. And, and I talked to a homeschooling dad at the homeschool convention we were at in Cincinnati. Uh, I don't know. I've lost track. It was last weekend. Um, <laughs> it was and, all, a, it was all a time warp. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a blur. Um, and he was saying he had picked up Latin, uh, a year or two prior because he wanted his kids to learn it. So he decided he was going to go learn it sort of in a crash course. And he told me, he said, I understand things about the English language that I never mm-hmm. understood 
you know, my entire life Mm -hmm. until I, all of a sudden Mm -hmm. I had to confront it in a second acquired language, especially an inflected one. And I've, I've taught with a a number of different methodologies. I've taught out of uh, all kinds of different Latin textbooks. um, And I've taught in a, in a spoken context. I've been a student as in a spoken context. uh, And I've taught in a more grammar charts and translation context. And I've been a student in a more grammar and charts and translation context. And I think Paul's original point that it really depends on your goals is exactly right. If you're number one, if all you want in the world is to be able to dream in Latin, you know, you just want to get your brain to that point where you're so saturated in Latin that your dreams just start, you know, spontaneously uh, coming up with with Caesar, uh, you know, and his funky haircut and he's doing yeah, weird I, things I and speaking that. Latin. If that's what you want, <laughs> yeah. immersion is the way, right? Uh, if you want that your brain to kind of flip over. But that's not our primary goal in teaching, especially kids uh, in at at this kind of core place that we give Latin in a classical education curriculum. Uh, It's nice when they can sit down with Cicero and just read it fluently and kind of think in Latin and it comes easily to them. But what we really want, I'm going to steal a phrase from Andrew Pudua, actually, this he he, he said that Latin gives you X-ray vision Mm. into language, not -hmm. just Latin, but any language, because it teaches you those fundamental structures. What what is a subordinate clause? Where's the subject of the sentence? How does, uh, what's the difference between active and passive? And it forces you to slow down and learn all of those parts. And it's funny. A lot of people say, well, couldn't, you know, French or Spanish or Greek do do it just as well. I think Greek is the the closest. Okay. But Latin has a unique ability to give you that x-ray vision into language. And if you want that, the charts and translation method is really where it's at. And, And even if you want to dream in Latin, you can go do a program to get you to that point after you've learned the grammar. So if you want both, do the grammar first mm-hmm. and then go jump into that yep. because you, you can get there. Even, I mean, what that d- it's going to do is if you ever do get stuck, I mean, sometimes I get stuck speaking English and I have to sit there and analyze what in the world did I just say, mm-hmm. you know, and it's the same thing if you get to that facility in Latin or Greek that, you know, sometimes you got to step back and go, what did I just say? So even if you learned it in immersion approach, Full, if you learn an emotion approach fully, you won't have those tools to be able mm-hmm. to analyze. Did I really do this correctly? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we've talked about a lot of the benefits of studying ancient languages. And so I want to end our conversation on a quick hitter. We haven't mentioned everything. What are other benefits that just in a couple of sentences you would say, this is why you should encourage your student to study ancient languages. This is why you yourself should pick up an ancient language at some point. And and I can start while you guys are thinking. There's a, a great book by a guy named Cal Newport called Deep Work. If you haven't read it, it talks about the benefit of in our cultural moment of learning how to focus, learning how to turn, tune out the restrictions and think deeply on a particular topic. And he tells a story of, a, uh, I think a businessman or, or some, you know, just regular guy who lives in New York and his practice is to every morning or, or very frequently to go to his synagogue and read a page of the Talmud written in, you know, ancient Hebrew and rabbinic Hebrew, um, every day. And he's talking about not really a spiritual benefit, although there may be for him. It, he's talking about the the cognitive benefit mm-hmm. of forcing yourself to do that task every day, to think about how words relate to each other, to tune out all distraction, to think about solving difficult problems for an hour by yourself. And I think that's one of the hugest benefits of this is the, the way it shapes your mind to be able to tackle difficult, sustained problems over time. Uh, yeah. And I'll just add to that, uh, and just say that that might be the biggest ad- advantage for most students, mm-hmm. the discipline required of learning another language, uh, is virtue forming. It teaches you how to be a faithful, diligent student who demonstrates, who achieves excellence, um, through, um, practice through excellent practices in their life. That may be the best thing for every student to learn Mm -hmm. in these young years. And I, and I guess I'll add to that another, you know, I did write two pieces for the classical teacher about why students should learn Greek. 
You yeah. can search his name on memoriapress.com as Mitchell <laughs> Holly. Mitchell L. Holly, yes. And, uh, you know, in, in one piece, um, I talk about uh, the uh, expressive power of language. Mm. In other words, language is not just something that we use to describe how we feel, although we do. We do use language to describe language also in our growth in linguistic capacity um, has the, it has the power to shape how we think and feel. And so by growing in language, by growing in, um, in that expressive ability, we open up avenues of thought, of feeling, of, um, uh, of contemplation that we would not otherwise have. And so your students literally will, will their brain is being shaped and developed and grown in ways that are in ways that only a la- growth in language can mm-hmm. right. Imagine thinking without words or thinking without a language think thought without language is, has no content. <laughs> uh, so in order to grow in thought and in order to grow in thinking, you must also grow in language. Uh, you need to be as Charles Taylor, the philosopher says a language animal. Um, not just a rational animal, but a a language animal. Right. Um, And I think that that by far has been um, the the most impactful thing for me as I'm reading texts when I had this sort of realizing that these years of studying has completely shaped how I think about problems um, because of learning growing in that ability to think through and shading different things. Right. Um, and I could give countless examples of this, but, um, but I'll just leave it there. Wrote two pieces. I, I want to build off of this. Although I do also want to disagree with one small thing that you said as the resident phenomenologist in the room. I have to, <laughs> I have to point out that it is possible to have thought with content, even if you don't have any words for it. I think we, experience that all the time, right? You, you experience something you just don't know what to call it. You can't think of the word, right? Um, but then however, when we get a, t- a name for it, then we're able to see ex- reflexively. Yes, this is, this okay. is, well, this is what I want to build okay. on, right? Okay. I agree entirely with the substance of everything that, that you were saying. Um, because I think there's this, this concept of a person's resolution in their seeing of the world. You know, we, we think about a low resolution screen, right? It only has so many pixels. Maybe it only has so many colors. And so it can only represent a fairly simple image. Whereas when you have a high resolution screen, you've got a lot more pixels. When you raise the the color space of something, you've got a lot more colors Mm -hmm. in those pixels. So you can represent a lot more at a lot sharper, uh, definition. Um, when I, when you just talk to different people, uh, you realize that they have different resolutions in their memories and their, their experience of the world. A simple example is taking uh, students through, through a museum. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards you, you just ask them, okay, what did you see? What did you experience? Mm -hmm. Okay. And one student says, Oh, we saw some stuff. We saw yeah. some paintings. Yeah. They were pretty, I guess. <laughs> there was a room and there there were paintings and the paintings were paintings of like dudes. Right. Another student says, well, we we walked into the Baroque room and there were uh, paintings that were portraying historical uh, scenes of heroes. And there was one particular painting that I very much liked of uh, Hercules's 12 labors that was uh, done in this very Baroque style. That student has a much higher resolution of their whole experience of that art museum. Okay, so this is my build up to make the language point, which is language gives you a much higher resolution to your experience of the world because it gives you names for things and it teaches you how to think more analytically about every little action that a person does, every little adjective that can attach to things, every noun, every adverb and having uh, words in English, but also in Latin and also in Greek gives you so many more angles uh, onto the world and enriches your experience of life. No disagreement. I would just add that uh, Von Humboldt, 
who is a German linguist made the point that there's a, the cry of the human soul is to accompany everything felt with a sound. Mm. And to that point, right. So like, I don't like von Humboldt, but that's a, that's a nice juicy uh, quote. It is juicy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And and, well, the, the point being providing names Uh for every inclination of the soul that you may not be able to articulate. And back to our Adam point at the beginning. Well, ironically, uh, Mitch and Dan are trying to take up all your words. (laughs) They are, but I still have words that they have not yet taken. Uh, No, I I think all of us have, have hit on, on similar points of discipline. And that is, when you first asked your question, that's what occurred to me was, you know, when I read climbing Parnassus after I'd studied Latin and Greek for years and years and years, and I, you know, I was just told I needed to read it. What really struck me was his argument about discipline. Right. Mm-hmm. And, but I think in there, if I remember correctly, it's been like a decade since I read it, but I think he makes the argument of discipline sort of in your line of focus. Um, and, and, you know, Mitchell, you're kind of hitting on that somewhat. Um, but, you know, where Dan's talking about sort of the enrichment of the mind, um, and you talked about this, this, this sort of um, characterizing how you think. And I think there is something particular about Latin, less so in Greek, but Greek also does this, that, that uh, regiments mm-hmm. the mind. And that's why, you know, if you ask Martin Cothran, uh, you know, if they say, I, if a parent says, I really want to start logic early, what do I do? He says, learn Latin, because that is going to change the way you think, you know, and you're going to think step by step. So when you get to the point of learning mm-hmm. logic, which is also going to be training you step by step, you're already in this mode. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's all those other, then it's ironic to me that we are like, as we're making this apology for it, like we're all talking about discipline and focus, Whereas in, in sort of enrichment of the human person, whereas most of the time uh, our messaging and others messaging is vocabulary, grammar, right. SAT scores, you know, all that sort of stuff, which all of that comes along. But, you know, we like to look at this sort Those of are side effects, grander yeah. picture of what it, what it means for, for that person um, and how that it changes the person, you know, themselves. It's kind of like the great John Christensen who once said, when you start defending the benefits of Latin, you've already lost. Mm. Because it's just that great. Mm. All right, well, I've really enjoyed this conversation with you guys. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Classical Etc. If you'd like to show your support for the show, then you can leave a like below. If you'd like to add your voice to the conversation, then you can comment. And if you want to follow along with us on this journey, then please subscribe. Thanks, and I'll see you later.